Good morning and welcome. I'm Pastor Nathan Stearman. On behalf of the Brunswick Seventh Avenue Church and the Gathering Place and the family and friends of Nancy Lord, I want to welcome you to this memorial service. It is a time of grief, but we also hope that it is a time of rejoicing as we both sorrow for Nancy's death and rejoice in the gift of having her life with us for so many years. Let us pray. God, we're gathered here to remember a woman who has touched so many lives from tax offices to state offices to those struggling to meet to make ends meet from day to day. We are here from all walks of life to remember a woman who has touched us. Grant us today peace in grief and joy even as we remember. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to begin with Psalm 23. If you know the psalm, feel free to speak it out loud with me. And I'm reading from the King James, which is probably the most familiar of the translations. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
Thank you so much for being here. Donna Marsh. Why Clancy? Okay. Nancy Lord, 75 years old at, of Brunswick, passed away on January 10th, 2020 in Burnett, Texas. She grew up in Manchester, Connecticut and went to Mar Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio, where she received a bachelor's degree in English. She also received a teaching certificate in 1966 and went on to receive her master's degree of English literature from the University of New Hampshire in 1968. She taught middle school for a short time before she marrying Oliver Jackson Dutton, and they had two children. She is survived by her two children, Amy Monk and Wendell Dallas Dutton, who she loves very much. She was a very daunting grandmother to Amy Monk and Thank you. <laughs> Marshall Noyes. She is also a survivor of her brother Jeffrey Holt and her husband Robert Lord. <clears throat> In June 25th, 1993, <coughs> excuse me, Nancy married Robert Lord at a quaint hotel cottage in Bailey Island. All four children were part of the wedding with all of our friends. Nancy lived at 21 Rocky Hill in Brunswick and was working for the Internal Revenue Service in Augusta. Nancy carpooled in a van to Augusta, so she made many friends. One of her dear friends was Molly Pitcher, who was actually Sergeant of Arms in the State House Senate. Her son was a state representative and then later a, uh, a Senate. Stan Gazowski. Stan is with us today and asked if he could share in the remembrance. Stan, are you there? <laughs> okay, Stan. Your turn. Your turn. Thank you. I didn't even recognize Dallas this morning. You've grown up. Nancy was a big part of me, but my mom, my family, especially my community. I never um, would have believed that such a kind soul would be leaving us so soon. Nancy was a person that continuously, always, went to bat for the little guy. She was the one that worried about people all the time. She had me jumping through hoops when I became a politician to make sure that <laughs> we were at least doing things that she thought were appropriate up in Augusta when it came to taking care of people that needed help, when it came to the health care, when it came to all those great issues that we all fought for. I never got sworn into office for anything without having my dear friend Nancy and her husband Bob at the swearing-in ceremonies. They used to like to come up to watch that their government really does represent them. They like to come up to see that the people up there with their nice titles were just ordinary people that you would find in any audience trying to do the best they could. And she 
admired that. She didn't always agree with them, but she always admired them. And once in a while at a ceremony or a welcome back day that they would come up to, um, I would have to kind of keep an eye on Nancy because she'd be debating with somebody about um, something they had said or some bill they had voted on that she didn't agree with. But where the world is definitely worse off without Nancy and her beautiful soul here, I know where she is, up in heaven. And we all have our own vision of heaven. She is trying to see who needs extra help. She's helping the Lord in his own job. <laughs> and she's probably got several suggestions for him. But my mom passed away a little while ago, and, and Nancy and my mom were really terrific friends. And Nancy was the best caregiver that I could ever imagine. In the middle of the night, if there was problems, I could call Nancy and Bob, and they would both be down. Bob and I would sit in the living room and stay out of their way. It was the safest place for us to be. But Nancy never forgot who she was and what her mission was. And her mission was always for the other person, never for herself. I don't remember her ever once uh, complaining about anything that happened in her life, um, not even the kids. She might have suggestions or two, but she loved those kids so much. And it's been a while since we've all seen each other, but I remember those days when we used to. And you guys, the last time I saw Nancy, we were talking about you. Every time we would see each other, we would talk about you. I can't tell you how many Thanksgivings we all had together, and we always brought up the children because that was her focus. So I just wanted to come in tonight just to say, or this morning, just to say how how much all of us will miss her, how much the community is going to miss her, how much the greater community is going to miss her. But we all know that wherever she is, she's doing the same job she did on earth. And she's um, uh, leading the way, I'm sure. Um, I'd, I'd hate to be, no, I'd love to be in heaven, but right now I would like her, my mom, and the Lord to sit down and have negotiations <laughs> of just how they're going to do things. So, Bob, always remember where Nancy is, is a better place. And we'll always love her and miss her. And as long as we're around to talk about her, she's still, in most of our minds, going to be alive. Because she, she brought so much with her, and she taught us all so much. So... I humbly um, wanted to say that because it's from my heart. It's the way I feel. It's the way that everybody feels. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. That means an awful lot. By the way, Stan, I was a Republican all my life, but your mother made me Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I think it was really about my stand on cat collars. Remember the cat? Excuse me. <clears throat> Nancy did many different jobs for the IRS. In later years, she organized the volunteer tax preparers who would do taxes at no cost. Nancy was in charge and set them up in Maine and New Hampshire. And she was responsible for finding the locations where these people would uh, uh, donate their time. Quite a job. In the Brunswick and Bath area, she worked with Marlene Budd for a long time, friend. The IRS would send Nancy all over the United States to teach. I remember going with her to Baltimore, Denver, Buffalo, and many interesting places. When Nancy retired, she worked with the volunteers in this area, Bath and Brunswick became close friends with Marlene Budd and Mary Louise Blanchard. Mary contacted me and she says, 
I'd like to say something. She, and uh, she's here today. Would you like to say, uh, she sent me an email. So I asked her to come up and present it. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everyone. As we all know, Nancy was an extraordinary volunteer for many organizations that offer help and care for our neighbors and our friends and for those who are less fortunate. Our volunteer program was one of the many that she served with distinction. After her 30-year career with the IRS, Nancy volunteered for the AARP Foundation Tax Aid Program, a free and confidential service for particularly low and moderate income people and with a focus on those over the age of 50. She was passionate about giving free tax assistance to those who could least afford, afford it, including a great many elderly taxpayers. She was not only a tax aid counselor in Brunswick and Topsom, but during her 14 years in the program, she offered to take on several leadership positions. She was the coordinator of the Midcoast District, responsible for overseeing a number of tax preparation sites from Freeport to Camden, she was the local coordinator and tax return transmitter at the Topsom Library. And she was the district's communications coordinator. In this capacity, she loved being the first contact for prospective volunteers. Recruiting many men and women into the tax aid program through her publicity efforts and welcoming manner. Whatever role she assumed, Nancy did it with great dedication and great ability. Her enthusiasm for what she did was unmatched. She was a dear friend to us all, her fellow volunteers. We miss her. We miss her very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you Bob. So much. You're welcome. Nancy shared my dream of sailing a boat. When I bought a 32-foot sailboat, we realized we needed training on how to use it. <laughs> so we, attending, uh, we attended the boating safety course put on by the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Well, Nancy took a large interest, so we joined, becoming the civilian branch of the Coast Guard. It was kind of interesting. So Nancy and I taught boating safety at SMTC, Southern Maine Technical College, for about five years. And there was an opportunity to teach, you won't believe this, but Code Guard members on sexual harassment. So the Coast Guard sent us to Otis Air Force Base and uh, to be trained how to teach it. Well, it turns out we actually went to five of the bases and taught a lot of Coast Guard people. And of course, she also went out on safety patrols with other auxiliaries helping distressed boaters. An opportunity arose to be a lighthouse keeper at the Boston Light. What a wonderful job that was. Keeping uh, keepers at the Boston Light. We would spend two weeks at a time with a lighthouse dog, with a lighthouse dog that, higher, that had higher rank than us. <laughs> so when he spoke, we had to obey. 
Nancy said, I was a lighthouse keeper, but then she jokingly said she was a lighthouse keeper. <laughs> our sailboat was our cottage on the ocean. Nancy's favorite place was Some Sound in Arcadia and Love Cove outside of Booth Bay. We spent time reading, listening to music, and studying our Sabbath school lesson. I belonged to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Brunswick, Maine, so Nancy always went with me. She became very interested in church. Her sister, Sally, taught her, took her to the Universalist Church in Manchester, Connecticut, and that's where Nancy was baptized. Nancy studied the Bible every night, she could. She was convinced of the seventh day to worship. She joined a book club at the Catholic Church, and she joined a Bible study group at the Gathering Place, where she spent a lot of her time. Nancy spent a lot of time praying and studying the, the Bible. Nancy loved doing missionary work. Nancy and I went to Zimbabwe, Africa, to Dr. Farrig's orphanage, where she taught English to 60 of the orphans. And she became a mother. They loved her. One day she was teaching. She told me, uh, in Zimbabwe, they have a poison snake, the green, uh, 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 green something. <laughs> Anyway, she was teaching, and one of them come in the back, come under the back door, and all the kids got up and left. She didn't know what was going on, and she all of a sudden saw it, so she left too. But you never know what might happen. It was kind of interesting. Nancy completed five trips to Mexico with Dr. Kruger, where she became the eyeglass specialist. And what happened was people donated a lot of glasses, and most of it was uh, just making up for people that, uh, that had to read books with nearsightedness. But she did it very well. And she liked to go out to the community, giving out clothes and food to those in need. When Nancy and I were at the orphanage in Zimbabwe, we met two other volunteers from Germany, Peter and Elvira Card, who lived in Bavaria, Germany. We became very close friends, so we invited them to visit us in the United States. When they came, we took them to Niagara Falls, Amish country, where they speak German. It was kind of interesting the, you know, the style of German speech, Virginia Beach, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston, and they said they like pop and beach the most. <laughs> we shared vacations a couple times. Last year, we went to Germany with them. We flew into Berlin. We checked out... Uh, lost my place here. We flew into Berlin. Oh, here it is. We flew into Berlin, saw Checkpoint Charlie. Then they took us to Potsdam in Wittenberg, where Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses on the church door. And then Munich, where you wouldn't, you'd be surprised what happened in Munich. We met two of the children that she taught at the orphanage. It was a wonder, that was 10 years ago. And uh, he was going to college and uh, the young lady was working as a maid.
We vacationed with them for three weeks, drove through Austria and to Italy, checked out the Leaning Tower of Pizza and stayed in many beautiful cities. It was just wonderful. And we ended up in Rome, where we had a chance to go through the Vatican and enjoy a lot of history of the Catholic Church. Now, Nancy took a great interest in the Catholic Church. She attended weekly, participating in the church mass. Sometimes I would go with her, and then sometimes she'd come to my church. Nancy and I attended a Catholic book club. We were there for about two years. Very interesting, quality information. Every year, we went to the midnight mass together. Nancy joined a group called So Blessed Ministry, and the So is S-E-W. They knitted scarves. The priest would bless them and give them to people in a hospital who were gravely ill. Nancy would, would be watching television with me, but she'd always be knitting. <laughs> and she also enjoyed quilting. She spent a lot of time with our friend, D. Green, making beautiful quilts. Nancy was very involved with her family. Her son, Dallas, joined the Army. We went to his military graduation. Nancy was so proud of him. Dallas served both in Afghanistan and Iraq and made the rank of corporal. When Dallas was honorably discharged, he settled in Burnett, Texas, near Austin. Well, it turns out my brother Phil lived in Austin. They became friends, and we would visit them. It was like a family reunion. Nancy's daughter Amy and Richard Monk, children Loic and Remy, lived in Virginia Beach. Amy and Richard worked in the hospital as x-ray and MRI techs. Richard loved soccer games, so he and the children played soccer. So when we came to visit, we always went to the game. Nancy encouraged Amy to support the Catholic Church. So Nancy was thrilled when both children were baptized. We went down uh, during the Easter and, and had a part in it. A very interesting situation developed where Nan, uh, Richard's monk's mother lived in Caen, France. So Amy wanted us to come to France and visit. Nancy decided, well, she decided to take French classes at Bowdoin College. <laughs> and if you're, you know, if you're a, a Brunswick retired member, you can monitor the classes. You don't get credit for it, but you can monitor. So she started uh, uh, taking lessons at Bowdoin. Next thing I knew, the French teacher's coming home for dinner, and they're all on, out there in the kitchen. <laughs> jabbering French and cooking up stuff. It was wonderful. She had a wonderful time learning French. So when we went to France, Paris was great. Nancy spoke Parisian French. Everyone understood her and had a wonderful time. We visited Richard's mother in Caen. Richard and Amy were there. So we babysat their son, Loic, and uh, Richard's mother, uh, took care of Remy, so, uh, so they could go and visit Paris. Now, we visited Amy often. On our way to Virginia Beach, we always stayed at Nancy's lifelong friend, Jan and Larry Sornarts, who lived in Connecticut, about halfway to Virginia Beach. Their mothers went to college with each other, and so they were, had very strong uh, sentiment. This was our start of our world traveling. We took many trips. Some was due to work seminars. They took us to San Antonio, Washington, D.C., Denver, Buffalo, Bermuda. And they were uh, company uh, uh, projects, but Nancy would always add on two weeks when we went to Bermuda, we spent three weeks there. It was wonderful. 
Nancy became very interested in the clothing place, soup kitchen, and the gathering place. She was very concerned about the homeless in Brunswick. She do donated a lot of money and time to help the homeless. Nancy purchased a small two-family apartment building in Brunswick. Well, she kept me busy. She was hoping to give the homeless a place to live. This went on for about five years, but Nancy had to sell the home. Nancy still wanted to find homes in the winter because of the cold. So she put some of these people up in homes. They were living in tents below zero. And she put some of these uh, people up in hotels. She had so much love for her fellow men. Nancy decided to go to her children's and grandchildren to work out her needs. Nancy helped Amy move into a new place, then went on to Dallas and Texas, and had a wonderful time. Nancy heard about the foreign exchange student program. So we went to a meeting. Next thing I know, a young lady from, uh, uh, her name was uh, Valeria from Columbia, came to live with, with us for a year. She attended Brunswick High School. Next year, it was Natalia from Ukraine, and then we had a, lady from, a young lady from Spain for the summer. We be became close friends. They still talk to me on the Facebook. Nancy told me she became a real go-getter. She took him here, took him there, then she went and got him. So anyway, it was a wonderful life that we lived. And I know that God is, uh, Christ has taken her at the right time. So thank you for listening to me. To Amy in Dallas and to her brother Jeff, I know he's not here today, and to Bob, I would like to extend special thoughts and prayers that this uh, service, this time, will continue to be a blessing to you and a comfort. It's a privilege for me to be in this assembly today to remember Nancy Lord. All of us have many thoughts of Nancy, and we just learned quite a few that we didn't know about from Bob. In just a bit, you will be given an opportunity to share a thought or two that you might have as well. Some of my thoughts of Nancy include her kindness, her caring, her intelligence, her hospitality, her giving, and her adventuresome spirit. Really, how many people do you know that spent weeks, if not months, living in a lighthouse. Nancy was a Christian and by definition she was a follower of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately I have been at more of these kinds of gatherings over the years than I would wish and it's always easy to find something nice to say about somebody. But I can tell you a little insight into a pastor's mind, and that is that it's a lot easier if they express their love for Christ and the belief in the Bible, because it's a book of hope. Some people refer to the Bible as a love letter. Some people refer to it as a manual for life. She desired to live her life patterned after her creator. There are many, many, many hundreds of places that we could look in the Bible to find uh, perhaps glimpses of how she interpreted Christianity and how she lived. One that I'm going to choose at this time is referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 30. 
And this parable given by Christ is in response to the question, who is my neighbor? I was happy to meet some neighbors, Bob, who are here today. And you picked up right where you left off in the conversation. I don't know how long ago it was, but neighbors are wonderful. And sometimes in the busyness and in the selfishness of this world, we need to ask ourselves that question, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus set about to answer that question by saying these words. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now most of us have had glimpses into the lives of people who have done some of the things that you have just learned from Bob and his remarks. But I don't think of anybody quickly whom I can assign greater deeds than Nancy Lord. Now Nancy's voice is silent, but this is not the end of the story. It was Helen Steiner Rice who wrote that death is not the end of the road, but rather a bend in the road. In fact, the Bible says something interesting when it says that the Christian will never die. So what does that mean? So why do we call it death? Why do we say somebody died? Why do we have services like this? It's interesting because Jesus himself didn't even call these kinds of services death. He referred to it more as sleep. In fact, he went out of his way to use that term when one of his closest friends had died and some other people who were very concerned about this man were uncomfortable that Jesus didn't rush to his side when he purposely chose to wait long enough so that the temporary death would be identified in his own words by he's asleep. And he purposely stayed away long enough so that they wouldn't say, when he arose him from the dead, that they wouldn't say, well, I guess he really wasn't dead. He was pretty close to being dead, but uh, we must have been mistaken. No, Jesus didn't want any mistake. He wanted to be able to identify this kind of arrest. And so that's what's put some punch and power and promise into the fact that there is hope beyond this life. And so when that writing is that the Christian shall never die, it means that we will never die the eternal death. In fact, when the Bible talks about this kind of death, it gives very little space and time. And many of us have read in the Bible where it says, this life is like the flower of the field. We're here today and gone tomorrow. And some of you who are young cannot understand that as well as those of us who have a different color hair than when we were your age. I can remember being told sometimes to wait for as much as a week for something that I might have wanted, or for a toy that had been promised to me, or for a fishing trip, or whatever. And waiting for a week would have been 
probably the equivalent of at least a year now. And most people who are a little older will say, time seems to be going by so much faster. Jesus' death on the cross to pay the price for the sins of the world was really an event out of love to make sure that we don't have to have these kinds of services anymore, ever. And so this temporary death or rest, in comparison to eternal life and peace and hope, is absolutely the greatest of all gifts. In fact, probably the most popular verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. Well, we live in the world, don't we? He's not talking about the dirt and the grass. He's talking about us. God so loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever, and you can throw your own name right in there, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news. That's why the Bible is called good news. And it's so nice to know that Nancy had that beating in her heart in a great manner, but she didn't, just didn't write about it and read about it and talk about it. She demonstrated that love of God through all of these avenues of helping human beings. Therefore, Nancy has helped me to understand that death does not need to be something that we fear. There are many wonderful promises concerning the death of the righteous, which is a term that is assigned to those who are believers in Christ. Let me read you a couple of quick ones. This is referring to how Christ looks at Nancy's life. Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Don't you like that word, precious? We don't usually throw that around much at funeral services and memorial services. How did it go over at Nancy Lord's funeral or memorial, somebody might ask? Oh, it was precious. What do you mean precious? It was precious? No, don't say precious. I didn't say it. God says it. We usually refer precious to cute little babies that we look, and we can always say that they're precious. We always want to say they're adorable. Sometimes we have to stretch the truth a little bit there for a few weeks. But it's precious. Two people who meet and fall in love use the word precious, I think, quite a bit. But here, the psalmist writes, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Pretty good insight about how Nancy thought about her creator and about how, how, how her creator thought about her. Listen to this one. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 32. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. Hmm. Many of you have been down the main turnpike and you remember where that sign used to be? I don't even know if it's there anymore about this wildlife refuge. That refuge might not mean too much to people zooming by at 60 or 70 miles an hour, but it means quite a bit to those ducks and geese and birds and whatever else found their way in there because that was a safe place. I like to think of Nancy in a safe place. I like to think of Nancy taking a nap, little nap, small nap. I'm one out of a litter of six children. I'm number five. And by the time I came along, a lot of my mother's um, ambition, <laughs> I think, had been strained to the max. In fact, every once in a while she used to say, oh, you're getting on my nerves or my nerves. 
And I can remember clearly and honestly and sincerity with inquisitive questioning saying, Mom, what's a nerve? I wanted to know where it was located, what it looked like, and what it, how it functioned at. I don't have to ask people anymore what nerves are and what they do, even though I don't understand all the technical part of it. So my mother would deal sometimes by going to bed and pulling the covers over her head for a while to kind of let things play out or people getting whatever happened to us when we did our, our kids running around. But I like to think of my mother taking a quick little nap and then the next time that she opens her eyes, she sees the, the face of Jesus. So again, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And Revelation 14, 13 says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Boy, if we were judged only by our works, I think Nancy would be first in line. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts on the idea of resurrection. And it's in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Like today, there were people in Christ's day who believed in the resurrection, and there were people who didn't. And so that's kind of the gist of what flows here in 1 Corinthians 15. And the writer was the Apostle Paul. It starts out by saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which is good news, which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. By Nancy's own claim, she received that news and she stood in that news and she lived in that news, and she functioned in that news, and she demonstrated out of her heart what that does, by which also you are saved. So my belief in Nancy Lord's gospel, in its essence and in its core, is what saves people. Another place, another parable of Christ was that he told quite a few words, and he said, you know, when I was in prison, you didn't visit me, and when I needed clothes, you didn't give me clothes. When I needed food, you didn't give me food, and all of a sudden, his followers, often referred to his disciples, said, whoa, whoa, what? Wait a minute here. We didn't know that you were in prison. We didn't know that you didn't have enough to eat or didn't have enough clothes. What's going on here? And Jesus said those famous words, when you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So easy in the society that we live in today to rationalize that life is a lot more dangerous today than it was when Nancy was a little girl, and it is in many ways. I always used to pick up hitchhikers. I don't pick up hitchhikers anymore because I've been scared by so many stories. One of my sisters, we have a little story that we kind of laugh about. A few years ago, she stopped. She saw this a young man on the side of the road, and he looked like he was desperate and homeless and helpless, kind of, needing a ride at least. And she stopped, and before she let him in, she said, are you safe? So I said, Barbara, that was really nice that you asked that question. Uh, but uh, I wonder about his honesty. What if he wasn't safe? What if he wasn't so honest? Is he going to say, no, I'm very treacherous. Uh, why don't you just uh, pass me by? But thanks for stopping. I don't think Nancy lingered a long time on people's faults, but she celebrated life and the gift of love. So Paul continues, he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. So I don't have to spend today telling you 
that it would be nice if there was some biblical story that said that sometime there might be a way out of the problems of this life and a way into eternity once we close our eyes for the last time. It's already happened. It happened at the cross. So my part is not to win the victory, but as one writer says, to accept the victory that's already been won. We could have a ticket to a lot of famous places or a lot of ball games or whatever we wanted, but until we accept that ticket and, and walk to the event, we're not experiencing it. Nancy knew that her ticket to happiness in this life and to eternity to come was in her love and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Well, verse 14, it says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is simply empty, and your faith is also empty, nothing there. I remember talking to a person once. He said what brought him to his knees and to thinking about Christ was the fact that I thought about my future, my eternal whatever out there. He said it was either eternal blank, nothing, end of book, closed chapter, nothing more, that's it, or what the Bible offered in terms of really just the beginning of my life, the beginning of eternity. What the scripture writer said, for the Christian, they will never die. And so for the Christian that dies, whether it's one instant or 5,000 years, for practical purposes, they see the face of Christ. It says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. That's generic. So yeah, we can all say we had good times in this life. Do have good times. Hope to have a lot more good times. I think that's part of God's will for all of us. That we be happy and useful, productive. But the real kicker comes when we realize that if we think about the best day with the best people, with the best food, with the best weather that we've ever had, it doesn't even begin to compare with the hope that Nancy had in her heart for the future. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard the glories of what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. So, my friend who contemplated that eternal blackness versus the promises of the Bible, he said, why would I choose anything else? Let's say I chose to believe the promises of the Bible, as Nancy did, and others of you who have accepted Christ into your life as your personal Savior. Let's say that I spent my life believing that. What's that going to do for me? Well, it's going to give me hope, it's going to give me peace, it's going to give me better health, a lot of counsel on finances, not a bad deal. And so what if at the end of the trail there's nothing there? What have I lost in comparison if I don't choose to believe? But if the other way around, I've lost everything. That's why the, Paul writes, if this is all we have, we are of all people to be pitied. It says, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now, this resurrection idea is a big deal. More people come on Easter weekend to church than any other time in the year, liking to hear that idea that, wow, loved ones that I have lost, according to the Bible, I can see again. I can be reunited with them. I can embrace them. I can spend eternity with them. It says, but each of us in our own order, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. 
for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And then these beautiful words in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is not some country. It's not some individual. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Wow. Kind of nice to think that Nancy will never have another ache or pain. She'll never have another disappointment. She'll never lose another argument to one of those senators or legislators who uh, may have disagreed with her. In 1 Thessalonians, it talks about the time when Jesus comes. The writer says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning the topic of death. For the Lord himself who came, was born as a little baby in Bethlehem, who spent 30-some years upon the earth, died upon the cross for our sins so that we could have the freedom to claim these promises that we're looking at, and then returned after going to the grave on that third day, came forth in that resurrection early that Sunday morning, People saw him. He ascended to heaven after a little while with the promise that I will come again. I will come again. Why? I'll come to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be forever. Pretty good deal. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, I hope this can be a reminder today. For those of you who don't know or don't believe or have toyed with either one of those, I would encourage you to at least take a look. There is some words that I would like to share with you that somebody passed me one day at the end of a worship service as I was greeting people. And uh, it's uh, kind of an unknown piece. I don't know who wrote it, but I like it. And I want you to think about Nancy as I read these words, but you can share a little bit for yourself. Save a little bit for yourself because these words are describing you as well. You're special. In all the world, there's nobody like you. Since the beginning of time, there has never been another person like you. Nobody has your smile. Nobody has your eyes, your nose, your hair, your hands, your voice. You're special. No one can be found who has your handwriting. Nobody anywhere has your taste for food, clothing, music, or art. No one sees things just as you do. In all of time, there's been no one who laughs like you, no one who cries like you, and what makes you cry or laugh will never produce identical laughter and tears from anybody else ever. You're the only one in all of creation who has your set of abilities. No one in the universe can reach the quality of your combination of talents, ideas, abilities, and feelings like a room full of musical instruments, some may excel alone, but none can match the symphony sound when all are played together. You're a symphony. Through all of eternity, no one will ever look, talk, walk, think like you do. You're special. You're rare. And in all rarity, there is great value. Because of your great value, you need not attempt to imitate others. You will accept, yes, celebrate your differences. You're special, and you're beginning to realize it's no accident that you're special. You're beginning to see that God made you special for a purpose. He must have a job for you that no one else can do as well as you. Out of the billions of applicants, only one is qualified. Only one has the right combination of what it takes. 
That one is you because you're special. No doubt, the greatest gift that we can yet give to Nancy is to explore her hope, to accept God's love, to allow it to guide us to that time and place when we can be reunited with her. I'm struggling with laryngitis, so I'm going to be, I won't be able to open up like a, so I'll be singing very gingerly, so I do my best. <laughs> so. I'm sure there's some who would like to share a thought about Nancy, and this is the time for you to do that. Uh, I think we have some microphones, do we, that are going to be circulating around? And uh, I'm not sure. Is this being recorded? Is this service being recorded? Yeah, it is. So this will be helpful on the uh, tape. Uh, if uh, you could speak into the microphone, I'm sure that would be helpful. Uh, anyone l want to share a thought, uh, a little story? Maybe we can... Learn something that we don't know about Nancy. I, um, I guess I'm Nancy's daughter-in-law. <laughs> um, she accepted me into the family um, a long time ago. And uh, I often think of her as one of the most amazing persons I ever met in my life. Um, John 8, 12, I think, best describes her. Um, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Right. She absolutely passed that on to me. And I'm going to miss her terribly, but I am looking forward to that day when I can see her again. Amen. Good. Thank you. My precious uh, memory of Nancy and Bob, but when Lydia Simonello moved out of town, 
um, she kind of introduced me to Bob and Nancy. To, and they took me under their wing, and I would come home sometimes once, twice a week, and they'd say, okay, you can come, come over to dinner. Bob's cooking. Or, <laughs> this is my week. <laughs> and then we'd sit and um, we'd, well, we tried to watch a fluff movie, but Bob would try to watch other movies. <laughs> he would call them fluff movies. But we'd uh, sit on the couch, and I have the blanket that we used to cover our feet with, her on one end and me on the other end, and that's my precious memory. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Okay, right here. Well, uh, we used to go to the museum and that stuff. Um, she was a good woman. Got me uh, and let's just say she we went a lot of places. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I used to volunteer at the soup kitchen, and there was a client who came in every week. He was unshaven. He lived in Harpswell. I don't know how he got there, but he came from Harpswell to the soup kitchen in Brunswick. Don't know what his method of transportation was, but he suddenly, I looked out, and he was standing beside his pickup. I says, I went back, spoke to him. He says, it's running. Oh, you got it fixed. I says, it's wonderful. Where did you get the money? And he saw Nancy walking toward her car, and he said, there goes an angel. Hmm. And she came up to me with $4,000. No questions asked, anything. I says, I intend to pay it back. I don't think he was able to ever do it. But she was willing to give him $4,000 to fix his 58 Ford pickup. Wow. Amazing. Thank you. My name's Jeff, and uh, I'm a member um, volunteer in the past at Gathering Place. I was a firefighter um, until I was injured. And I don't remember the exact first time that I met Nancy, but it was uh, pretty much the same conversation we had every time. Somewhere along the lines, she would ask me what team I was rooting for at that time, and that's why I'm wearing my Bruins jacket today. <laughs> um, and I don't know that she never really understood the, the love I had for hockey, but um, one of the other things that we did have in common is she loved to go for walks. And with everything I've been through, sometimes the only way I can kind of clear my mind and, like I say, recharge my soul is to go north to my family's camp on Moosehead and disappear for a while. And so we had many conversations over that, and I'm going to miss having that person to talk to about it. Hi, I'm Janet, her niece. Um, she was really there for me when my mother passed away. She made sure I was able to fly out and spend um, her last moments with me um, and to bring photographs um, and you know to share memories and put pieces of the puzzle together. Um, because I wasn't there the whole time. Um, I've had my own tragedies in my family, too. So she was always there for me, and she's very compassionate. And she, was, she always had this way of putting a spin on things in a really serious situation, and I would just die laughing. Like, her <laughs> sense of humor was amazing. <laughs> I just wanted to add that. That's all. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If anybody else would like to, you're more than welcome to. I'm sure there's going to be right, uh, right down here, Paul. 
Thank you. My husband and I are directors at the clothing bank next door to the gathering place, actually where the gathering place got their start. And Nancy's been one of our volunteers, too. We really, we really miss her. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, we got some right here. Um, I'm Nancy Chandler. I'm a fellow volunteer at the Gathering Place, and I want to be sure that everyone is, realizes we're having more sharing there after this event with food, and it's not at the address in your program. It's at 510 Way next to the clothing bank and the, the hunger, Coast Hunger Prevention Center between the two. So please come if you yes. want to share more. Yes, and thank you for mentioning that. That, the, that correction on the address on the back of the bulletin will be announced again in a moment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Dutton. I'm um, Amy's father's first cousin. So I'm her, her first husband's cousin. Um, and I'm here today because when Amy and Jack got together, I was probably like in seventh or eighth grade, and I just remembered she was very cool. <laughs> she um, she could hang with the guys. Um, I you know watched the guys with her, my father, you know other other co older cousins, and she could hang with them and watch football and and she seemed to be really accepted and. Then she could be with the women and be accepted too. And she was very warm to us. Um, you know, as I say, I was small when I met her, or young when I met her, not small. I probably was small because I, <laughs> I didn't grow till I was older. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just remember her being um, kind and smart and, as you said, compassionate. And she was really one of the only ones that really looked me in the eye when I was talking. And, you know, when you're younger person, if somebody talks to you, you could have a sense of whether or not they were really paying attention to you and cared what you said. So on behalf of my brother and my two sisters, we wanted to pay our respects to Nancy because she was such a really important part of our family for a season and her children remain so. I remember my cousin Diana said once when Jack and um, Nancy were up in Maine near, near the coast that um, they really loved their kids, not for how they behaved or what they did, but they loved them because they were. And I remember being very touched by that. So I'm very sorry for Dallas and Amy and the rest of the family. Hi, my name is Catherine, and I volunteered with Nancy at the clothing bank and at the gathering place. At the clothing bank, she had her special time she came in, but she always told me on the side, if you need me, just call me. And whenever I did, she was always there to help. At the gathering place, she tried to help everyone that she could. One of her last conversations I had with her was asking how this one or that one was doing. She took time and she sent us, she sent me and she sent the gathering place, sleeping bags, tents, tarps, just to make sure everybody was safe and okay. And I'll always remember that. So I'm Jenny, Nancy's stepdaughter for 25 years. And I just feel blessed my brother and I feel very blessed that she was our stepmother. I couldn't have asked for someone better to be my stepmother, to take care of my father. And I know my brother feels the exact same way. We had a conversation about it last night, so. <laughs> okay, and like has been expressed, there'll be plenty of uh, time to uh, communicate as well at the gathering place and at this time we are going to enjoy a trumpet solo by Bradley Kruger.
Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have and continue to have of sharing the story of Nancy, sharing the journey of life with her for as long as we've had the privilege. As we leave this place, may the comfort of Jesus be with us, and may the inspiration of Nancy's life be with us. May her kind, caring, giving continue to inspire us to give as well. In Jesus' name, amen. There will be a gathering at the gathering place. There will be food there and time to remember Nancy together. You are all welcome to invite Invited to meet us there, and the location is, as was mentioned already, 510 Way. That is over near Midcoast Hunger Prevention, as well as the Community Services Center and the Gathering Place. So it will be at the Gathering Place there on 510 Way. As we exit today, I'd like to invite the family to leave first, and then the pastors, myself and Bob, will follow. And then the ushers will usher you out. So family, I'd like to invite you to leave first.